Okay, thank you, Pete. Uh, you're all gluttonous for punishment. By my count, this is lecture number five in, in, in today. Is that right? Uh, if we tried that at Auburn University, I think the, the room would be vacant. You know, they'd all be out uh, lying in the sun or whatever. Uh, Capital-based macroeconomics. Uh, the biggest application, most prominent application, is the Austrian theory of the business cycle. But it has a lot of other applications, too. That, that uh, business cycle stuff is just a couple of chapters in my book. I also deal with uh, the effects of regulatory reform, uh, the effects of fiscal policy, taxation, government spending, and that sort of thing. Uh, and the object is to s set out a macroeconomic model that uh, is true to the Austrian school uh, and that facilitates a fairly simple comparison between the Austrians and, say, the Keynesians. In fact, my second lecture, which is on Thursday, uh, will do just that. It will show you how uh, the Austrian school differs from the Keynesian in the most uh, critical ways. Uh, today, I just want to uh, exposit the Austrian view. Again, capital-based macro. Now, uh, I use that phrase uh, mainly in my courses at Auburn, where I have a more general audience or where I don't have a uniquely Austrian uh, audience because I get tired of answering questions about uh, why should this be applicable to the Austrian economy or what do you mean by this Australian economics? No, no, it's Austrian <laughs> economics. But uh, for this crowd, hey, we call it Austrian macroeconomics as that's what it uh, really is, that's where it came from. Uh, I want to start out uh, giving you a little road map here, uh, capital-based macro in perspective. Uh, and uh, we have sev several elements uh, of the model, most of which are off the shelf uh, in standard uh, macroeconomic uh, analysis or standard economic analysis. The only one that's uh, unique to the Austrian school uh, is the structure of production, about which you heard much already uh, in talking about capital theory and in Professor Kirchner's lecture, the idea of uh, multi-stages with the output of one stage feeding in as input uh, to the next stage. And so we have a sequence of stages uh, that uh, depict how production takes place through time. Uh, so that's unique to the Austrian school. But besides that, I'm using the production possibilities frontier, uh, which is a staple in almost all uh, entry-level macroeconomic texts or economic texts generally to show trade-off, uh, opportunity cost, to get more of one thing you have to give up something else. Uh, I have the loanable funds market which is a straightforward application of supply and demand uh, to the loanable funds market and uh, Israel Kirshner has uh, personally given me permission to use supply and demand curves for that purpose <laughs> even though at some higher philosophical level uh, they have their problems. Uh, Stage-specific labor markets, the key here is that uh, markets are plural. Uh, in uh, standard macro, uh, we make do with one labor market, the labor market. Uh, and that's typical not just of Keynes, but of the other macroeconomic theories as well. Uh, it turns out that if you have a structure of production and stages of production, then the, then the market for labor uh, varies uh, in important ways, in systematic ways. Uh, from one stage of production to another, and uh, the Austrian theory picks up that variation and uh, makes something of it. We'll see how that works. Uh, I have two applications, and here I don't mind stealing my own punchline because uh, if, you, if you see where the argument's going uh, from the start, you've got a better chance of seeing how it gets there, okay? So the applications are first to start out with uh, sustainable growth, in other words, the market working like it should, uh, to do what we expect it to do. Uh, and uh, in that case, uh, we have growth supported by saving. And here I can draw on uh, the lecture that uh, Peter Lewin just gave. This traces clear back to Adam Smith. Saving being a prerequisite for growth, certainly for uh, sustainable growth. 
And uh, the second application uh, is the business cycle. It's just unsustainable growth. In other words, the economy can be made to grow faster uh, in the near future, but uh, at the expense of uh, coming unglued. Uh, in other words, it's an artificial boom. It's not supported by saving. It's support supported by money creation. So unsustainable growth is triggered by credit creation on the part of the central bank. Looks good uh, in the beginning, but goes bad uh, at the end. Uh, it's a story told many times over, and certainly in the recent episode of Boom and Bust, as the previous episode of the dot-com uh, boom and bust. Uh, and of course, it's not really that the politicians can't learn. Uh, it's that they learn all too well, that you can create a boom and uh, harvest the votes, as I like to say, uh, after which you get the bust and then uh, you try to clean up the mess uh, after that. So it works politically, even though macroeconomically it doesn't work very well. Uh, I can uh, give you this brief rundown here. Uh, you've already heard a lot about Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek. And this theory traces to Mises in his 1912 book. So it's a theory that certainly preceded uh, the work of uh, Maynard Keynes. Uh, however, uh, the treatment of the Austrian theory of the business cycle in that 1912 book amounts to just a, a, a couple of pages near the end of the book. Uh, and at the time, and even later, uh, Mises didn't think of it as being particularly Austrian. Uh, all he was doing by his own uh, account was uh, putting together the insights of the Swedish school, namely Newt Bixell, uh, who showed that uh, banks can depress uh, market rates of interest below the natural rate of interest, create a discrepancy uh, in that way. Uh, and he put that idea together with Bombeberg's capital theory, uh, which emphasized the temporal element uh, in the production process. If you put them together, you get an unsustainable boom, followed by a bust, it turns out. Uh, Mises uh, sketched out that theory uh, in the span of just a very, very few pages. And it was Hayek that then came along uh, in the late 20s and throughout the 30s, writing books and articles uh, and developing uh, the Austrian theory. And uh, to that end, he used a little graphical device that, uh, that he called the Hayek, or that came to be called the Hayekian Triangle. And even it wasn't so original, although Hayek thought it was at the time that uh, he drew it, uh, that the uh, diagram itself is in the work of uh, William <coughs> Stanley Jevons in 1871. He was one of the co-marginal revolutionaries. He called them uh, investment figures. But uh, certainly a triangle, just like the one Hayek drew. So uh, it, it's not all that uh, out of line with uh, British economics, it turns out. Now, I want to make uh, one methodological point. Uh, and it's a paraphrase of Hayek. Uh, and if just in reading it, you have to uh, uh, concede that it's true. Surely it has to be true. He says, before we can even ask how things might go wrong, we must first explain how they could ever go right. All right? So before uh, we could even ask how the, the process of growth comes undone and turns into a bust, we need to understand uh, how a healthy economy can grow. Uh, and this is a, a maxim, a methodological maxim that Hayek adhered to, but virtually nobody else did, certainly not Keynes. Uh, now, in Keynes' defense, uh, it's not that he just failed to do that methodological uh, preliminary. It's, it's that he was sure from the outgo that markets don't go right, that markets are inherently flawed. The final chapter of his general theory talked about the fundamental flaws of the capital system. And uh, the flaws amounted to the economies not being able to hit upon some growth path uh, that could be sustained. So there wasn't any process uh, in that regard according to Keynes. If you look at the, at the Chicago School work, they take the opposite view, that the, there's, there's really nothing wrong with uh, going wrong in the uh, investment sector and the supply and demand for loanable funds. In fact, that works 
well enough or works so well that we don't need to include it in our macroeconomic theory. We can lump saving and con or lump investment and consumption together, call it output, label it Q, like you saw uh, in Horowitz's talk, uh, and, and go on with it. That uh, MV equal PQ is sort of the basis for Chicago macro theory. And if you want to know what goes on inside Q, in other words, how much of it is consumption, how much in, is investment, and how does that get decided in a market context? If you want to know about that, ask the microeconomists. They, they worry about that stuff. We're, we're macroeconomists. We, we work with big stuff like Q. Okay? So for Friedman, that mechanism worked so well, nothing needed to be said about it. And for Keynes, that mechanism was so flawed, there wasn't anything to say about it. Uh, the Austrians here have sort of a middle ground position. That, this market can work uh, if allowed to work, but boy, it's prone to uh, intervention on the part of the central bank. Uh, if it distorts interest rates, it causes it not to work. So that's, that's uh, the underlying theme uh, of the business cycle. Okay. Well, let's start with the production possibilities from here. And uh, use uh, our two axes, consumption and investment, as to depict alternative uses of resources. And it, just looking at that frontier, you see a, a, a major, major difference between this and a Keynesian approach. In, in Keynes, investment is added to consumption. Uh, the two components are just two ways of spending money. But the emphasis, of course, is on spending in the Keynesian view. Uh, spend on consumption, spend on investment, total private spending, hey, C plus I. Okay, put it all on the vertical <coughs> axis. Uh, the Austrians are looking at alternative ways of using resources with <coughs> consumption here on the vertical axis and investment uh, on the horizontal. Uh, I say here under favorable conditions, and I just mean that no interventions in the system, let uh, labor markets clear, let uh, loanable funds market clear, let prices clear, uh, establish market prices uh, all around. Uh, the economy will allocate uh, resources, part to consumption, part to investment, in a way that uh, satisfies uh, people's preferences, including their time preferences. How much do they want to uh, produce for consuming today, and how much do they want to use to beef up the productive capacity of the economy and here I'm just pointing out that uh, you see this curve in the principles text uh, to illustrate the basic concept of scarcity. Uh, you see it uh, with international trade as an implication uh, where you look at different countries and different ways they uh, divide up their uh, uh, allocation of resources. But you hardly ever see it uh, in the context of macroeconomics. It comes out in growth theory but not in macroeconomics, which would include business cycle. In the Austrian view, we can, we can show it and use it uh, in our theory. I might mention before I uh, leave this uh, simple figure as it's drawn, is that the frontier in, in my book, and, and actually in the principles text too, you can check any number of principles texts to verify this, if you're using it in a, in a macro context, in other words, consumption spending versus uh, investment spending, the frontier itself is defined as sustainable levels of output. Okay, what are levels of output that can be sustained, actually could be sustained over time? Uh, which suggests uh, that it's possible uh, to produce beyond the frontier, it's just not sustainable. If you push the economy, we say overheat the economy in, in uh, popular jargon, if, if the economy is overheated, it means specifically it's pushed beyond where it can be sustained. It's pushed beyond the frontier, but can't be uh, sustained at that level. The frontier shows sustainable levels. Uh, now, so when, I, when we feature this uh, trade-off, it turns out it provides a contrast to the Keynesian construction. They add them up together, uh, where those two magnitudes are both on the vertical axis. Investment here is gross investment. Uh, 
So the current level of investment there is at horizontal distance. And of course, uh, a lot of that, uh, of gross investment, is just replacement capital. Uh, the capital is getting worn out, it's becoming obsolete. Uh, and each year, so much investment has to be undertaken just to make good uh, on the depreciation, on wear and tear, and on uh, obsolescence. Uh, but typically, that amount of investment is a substantial portion of total investment, but it's not all of it. It's not all of it. So here we'll show replacement capital as being part of the investment, even a big part, but not all of it. Uh, as a result, then, the difference is net investment. So in this given year that I've got on the board, uh, so much net investment is produced, which means that next year the production possibility frontier will be uh, shifted outward. Okay, uh, So the, the frontier will shift outward uh, so long as there's net investment uh, in each period. Okay. And so positive net investment simply means that the economy grows, shifts outward from year to year, permitting increasing levels of both consumption and investment in year one and year two and so on. That's sustainable growth. Okay, so watch, watch the economy grow. Here it goes. Hey, you can hear the economy grow, right? The economy grows. It's perfectly sustainable. Uh, people are saving and financing the investment. It looks something like that. Okay, I'm showing four periods, uh, and I want to recognize uh, the actual rate of expansion depends on many factors, and I mentioned two here. Uh, one is that with more capital, well, there's more depreciation, there's more obsolescence, and so on. So that can affect the particular rate of growth. Plus, uh, element I haven't shown here. As people become more wealthy, this is a growing economy, and as, econ and as people become more wealthy, they tend to increase their saving even as a percentage of their income. And so that might uh, induce uh, still more growth. That's how you get a takeoff period in uh, a growing economy. The more wealthy you get, the more you're able to save and therefore grow faster. That's sort of an empirical historical observation, not uh, a necessary uh, result. But here I'm just showing uh, the economy growing, that's the point, uh, as net investment is undertaken uh, at each point, okay? Now, importantly, I should have underlined or italicized that word importantly, uh, there can be a change in saving preferences. And if there is, that provokes a movement along the PPF in some given year. Right? If people decide to save more, that means they decide to consume less, to forego current consumption, and save for uh, greater consumption in the future. All right? Uh, people can become more thrifty, more future-oriented. They reduce their current consumption and save instead. I have to dwell on this if, if my students have been through a course in Keynesian economics, because if you remember Keynesian economics, uh, saving doesn't change. Preferences don't change. Saving is dictated solely by income. You write the equation. C equals minus A plus 1 minus B times Y. There's no, it doesn't shift around. A and B are parametric and they are, they stay what they are. Uh, but the Austrians realize that saving can change. And certainly we realize that today. People can decide to save more. Uh, to provide for the retirement, for instance, once they figure out that the government might not be there for them. Okay. Or to pay for travel because they expect to live longer than uh, they had an earlier thought and they want to travel during their retirement years or they want to pay for a rest home in their retirement years. I mean, they have all sorts of reasons they might decide. They want to send their kids to college. They see that as more important than they had formerly. So people can decide to save more. So it says watch, watch the movement along the PPF, and I want you to watch it and then appreciate it, what it, what it means that you can move along. Here it goes. You can move along the PPF, okay? You can move along. Now, realize that's contrary to anything you'll find in Keynesianism. Keynes does not allow movement along the PPF. You're not allowed to trade off consumption uh, in favor of more investment. And in fact, he shows, he admonishes you, don't, don't try it. Don't even think about it. Because if you do, it won't shift you along the frontier, it'll send you into the 
interior of the frontier, you'll be in a depression and you'll wish you hadn't done it. It's called the paradox of thrift, featured in the general theory. Okay? Hayek and the Austrians are essentially saying that if, if the economy is working right, if markets are behaving like we think they behave, you can make that trade off. All right? So with increased saving and investment, the economy grows at a faster rate. Well, of course it does. Let's see if we can get it to do it. Watch the economy grow. Shifting out uh, more rapidly, okay, bigger increments because you saved, right? Uh, and it's, uh, it's the thriftiness that made the difference. Uh, let's just compare that PPF with the one I had on the screen before. There it is. Uh, and note here uh, that the difference that initial increase in saving makes in the pattern of consumption and investment. Uh, look at the one uh, on the left first. Uh, yeah, it grows. It grows, modest rate, okay. Uh, but with saving in the initial period, okay, then uh, consumption first falls. Then it grows at a faster rate, all right. Uh, and uh, after the four periods, just tracing across, you can see the, uh, the people are able to consume more than they were uh, had they not saved. All right. Now, I, I want to be careful not to sound like your parents. Okay, your parents will tell you you should save more. You no, know? you should save more, and uh, that will grow. Uh, and then later you'll be able to buy uh, a lot more. You'll be able to consume a lot more. You'll be glad you listened to my advice. You see, save more now. Just do it. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just showing that there is a connection. There is a connection uh, between your willingness to save and the, eco and the economy's ability to grow in a sustainable fashion. Uh, it's, just, it's the same point that made by Kirshner when he talked about walking out the window for the fresh air. Right. He's, he stopped short. He didn't advise you not to walk out. You know, walk out if you want, but uh, take heed to the consequences. So save what you will, but the consequences are if you save a little, the economy will grow pretty slow. If you save a lot, uh, it'll grow pretty fast. Okay? In this day and age, people are uh, inclined to save a little, but then vote for the candidate who proclaims the most loudly that he will grow the economy. <laughs> okay? This is a formula for disaster. If, if he figures out how to do it, it'll be artificial growth. It'll be a boom and it'll end in a bust. Okay? Now, we do loanable funds market. And you've already seen this a couple of times uh, in this conference, so I can make uh, short of this. I'm just plotting here the rate of interest on the vertical axis and both savings and then separately investment on the horizontal axis. Uh, the savings is upward sloping. Again, we're in violation of the general theory because Keynes says saving doesn't depend on the interest rate. Keynes would draw, draw that curve straight up and down. Uh, investment uh, gives rise to a demand for investment funds that slopes downward. And again, Keynes virtually denied that, saying that uh, that curve is straight up and down. In other words, investment is what it is based on, based on levels of optimism, a fire in the belly, animal spirits is the word he used as a psychological thing, confidence in the economy. Uh, it's those kind of factors that determine investors' willingness to undertake investments and not the interest rate. Uh, later in Keynes's general theory, he admitted, uh, but begrudgingly, that the interest rate affects investment a little bit, but not very much. And it's so dramatically affected by psychological factors that shifts in the curve just swamp uh, any movement along the curve. It's so interest inelastic. So for all practical purposes, it's straight up and down. Okay. Well, here again, uh, if the uh, interest rate is doing its thing, if it's allowed to seek its uh, equilibrium level, uh, then you get Quantity saved equal quantity investment. You get saving equal investment as a result of the equilibration in the, the loanable funds market. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, 
two economists who you wouldn't expect to agree on much uh, agreed on this point, that, that uh, this loanable funds market is conceived in very broad terms, uh, where it, uh, it essentially stands for people's willingness to save, uh, that's the saving, and business community's willingness to invest. And so uh, the corresponding interest rate is a very broadly defined rate. It's the intertemporal terms of trade generally, not just the rate uh, in uh, the market for long-term uh, treasury bills, or not just any particular narrowly defined financial rate, but the general terms of trade uh, of goods now for goods later. Uh, that's the interest rate we're talking about. Uh, and uh, that's the rate that bring together uh, saving and investment, okay? So the market becomes equilibrated uh, in that respect. Uh, one point I might make, because this came up in, a, in an earlier conference, uh, is that uh, that saving uh, nets out, let me say it in, in a way that might be kind of cryptic, but then I'll explain. Uh, I'll say that the consumer lending, consumer borrowing, is netted out on the supply side. In other words, we all go to work, we produce stuff, we get paid for it, it's called income, and we save part of it. Now some of you save nothing, and others of you even borrow to consume. All right? That's just the way you are. All right? Well, fine, but let's look out at how much we collectively, as income earners and savers, make available to the investment community. So. Uh, I might save some, but you, you borrow some of it and spend on consumption goods. Well, okay, that reduces how much saving goes to the business community. So it's, it's the net saving, in that sense, that gets borrowed by the business community. That's how we're able to show that horizontal distance as investment, okay? This uh, market, loanable funds market, it's in Marshall, it's in Alfred Marshall, but uh, it's most closely identified with Dif uh, Dennis Robertson, who was uh, uh, a student and a lab collaborator to some extent with uh, Keynes in an early period at least. Uh, so just to anchor it there, this there, uh, loanable funds market. Uh, and one thing that will become more important in my second lecture, but I'll mention it now, is that that diagram, believe it or not, is the one and only diagram that appears in the general theory. If you thumb through the general theory, you see no diagrams. You, students expect to see diagrams. There are no diagrams except that one. All right? And Keynes put it in on the suggestion of Roy Herod, because when Roy Herod read the manuscript of the general theory, he says, my God, Keynes, it looks like you're throwing out the loanable funds market. And you'd have to if both saving and investment are vertical lines. Looks like you're throwing out the loanable funds market. And Keynes says, yes, that's it. I'm throwing out the loanable funds market. And Herod told him, well, if, if that's what you're doing, you better make that perfectly clear to your reader. Otherwise, he won't believe you. Keynes says, all right, I'll do it. And so he put it in. And throw it out, okay? Put it in the book just to say this is what I'm throwing out. This is what have this is what I have to clear out of the way before I can offer my own theory. Okay? So there goes the loanable funds market. The only diagram to appear on page one eighty, I think it is, uh, got thrown out. But it's uh, critical to the uh, to the Austrian theory. Much of the theory of the Austrian school is based on the loanable funds market, but Austrians aren't uh, prone to draw diagrams, so you don't see it drawn too much, but I like it, I draw it, right? Let's let people become more future-oriented, thriftier, they save more. That causes the interest rate to fall, encouraging business community to undertake more investment projects, all right? So just watch the saving curve shift rightward. Okay, here it goes. Shifts rightward, people become uh, more thrifty. And so you can see that drives down the interest rate, that uh, causes the investors to borrow uh, those additional saved funds and undertake uh, projects of one sort or another. 
uh, you see how that works. So with given technology, saving and investment are prerequisite to genuine sustainable economic growth. This is, you know, savings comes in here as a prerequisite. It's, it's borrowing that savings. That's after all what they're doing, you see. Again, you earn an income, you spend part of it, and save the rest. You earn the income by producing stuff. But you don't buy all the stuff, okay? And your savings is transferred to the business community who uses those funds to take command over the stuff that was produced but not consumed. And that's the sources, the resources that can expand the productive capacity uh, of the economy, okay? Now here I'm just showing you that the loanable funds market and the production possibilities front here tell uh, mutually reinforcing stories. And we can put them on the board uh, together, <coughs> lining up investment upstairs with investment downstairs. So you can see how much uh, uh, goes to, is allocated to investment that's regulated by the loanable funds market and with prices and uh, wage rates clearing their respective markets, the economy is on its production possibilities front here and, and generating the amount of consumption uh, that you see, okay? That's what that verbiage uh, says. Uh, so these two elements just tell different perspectives on the same uh, story. Uh, and as before, I want to put, put this through its paces. We'll let people become more thrifty, more future-oriented. Uh, and uh, we'll watch uh, the saving-induced movement along the frontier. So what you have to do here is sort of turn your head sideways so you can watch the top diagram with one eye and the bottom diagram with the other. And for those who can't do that, well, I'll play it twice. But watch what's going on. You get an increase in saving. There it goes. And that generates a movement along the frontier. So just two perspectives of the same story. If they're saving more, they're consuming less. The consuming less is shown upstairs, okay? Uh, and the uh, increased investment... Uh, uh, comes along with the uh, saving. People are uh, borrowing those saved funds at a lower rate of interest uh, and investing. It's the way it works. Okay. So the lower rate of interest establishes new equilibrium in the loanable funds market as the economy moves along the PPF in the direction of more investment and less current consumption. Now, even this possibility is ruled out in the Keynesian system. Okay, it can't work that way, according to Keynes. And the way you see that is that you have investment and consumption moving in opposite directions. Well, of course, you're giving up some consumption to get more investment. But with Keynes, those two things always move up and down together. Just the structure of his framework causes C and I always to move up and down together. All right? So it can't happen that way. Uh, this is only to recognize, of course, that movements along the PPF necessarily entail opposing movements in saving and investment, okay? Now, what does Keynes say? And this, you'll recognize this as a very stereotypical Keynesian kind of argument. If there's a reduction in consumer spending, that would result in excess inventories, which in turn would cause production cutbacks, worker layoffs, spiraling down in the economy uh, of income and expenditures. The economy would go into recession, and the business community would commit itself to less, not more investment. Okay, so the economy would just sink into the PPF. Instead of going along it, it would come inside of it. In fact, Keynes gives a name to this. He calls it the paradox of thrift. Paradoxically, if you try to save more, you'll simply earn less. It's Keynes' paradox of thrift. All right? uh, so he denies even the possibility of this. Now, it turns out, if, if you think in terms of just retail sales, that would be in the late, late state of, stage of production, then Keynes is right. In other words, if you stop buying stuff uh, at retail, you're not buying so much at, at Walmart or, uh, or uh, at Target uh, or at Rich's or wherever you shop, you know, you're not, you're not buying as much as before. Well, those stores will quit stocking the shelves as often. They won't have to. They might not hire as many stock people as they were. They, they won't hire as many trucks to bring goods to 
the department store as they did. So you see the flavor of the Keynesian view. Uh, but he's just looking at one aspect of the change. Because yes, yes, you got lower demand for consumption now, but at the same time, you've got a lower interest rate. That has other implications. If you work out the implications of lower interest rate, you see that at early stages of production, uh, there will be an increase in investment. Okay? Now, uh, interest rate effect dominates in long-term early stage investments. A lower rate of interest can stimulate industrial const construction, for instance, or product development, or housing boom, for that matter. Uh, when we say early stage, you know, we might be talking about extraction of ore from uh, the ground. We might be talking of product development. Or uh, we might be talking about a housing boom. Maybe a better description of early stage is interest rate sensitive. Okay? Any, anything that's interest rate sensitive, and Lord knows housing is interest rate sensitive. You know that if you've gotten a mortgage lately. <laughs> okay? uh, and so anything that's interest rate sensitive uh, gets stimulated during uh, uh, the initial phases of a boom, whether it's a genuine boom or an artificial boom. To keep track of this, though, that's where we need the Hayekian triangle, okay? The structure of production. So the, the Hayekian triangle uh, is simply a, a sequence of stages of production from product development through eventual retail with, with the time element actually represented, in my case, on the horizontal axis. Uh, so let's see if we can get a structure. There's a structure of production. A Hayekian triangle. Uh, and you have early stages to the left. The final stage <coughs> is the output of consumption goods. So that consumption is not simply any vertical part in that triangle. It's simply the output of the final stage of the triangle. Any other stage is the output of that stage as input to the next stage. And at the, in the earliest stages, uh, where consumption is far removed, the value of that product is relatively low, partly because there's a lot of stuff to be done before you get to the final output, and partly because it's remote in time. In other words, it's discounted by the interest rate. Uh, the more heavily discounted, uh, the higher the interest rate. Okay? Uh, so that's the way the triangle looks. Uh, so there's a product development at an early stage. Okay, it's gonna, this guy looks competent, looks like he knows what he's doing. He's certainly got something in mind, but it's going to be a long time before he's got that ready for sale uh, at targets. Okay? Uh, late stage is something like uh, retail inventories. He's stocking shelves at retail. Uh, it won't be long before a customer comes. There's not any there yet, we're sorry, but you know, they'll be there and in fairly short order. Later on, we'll re replace those pictures with supply and demand diagrams, demand for labor in those stages. Okay. So uh, this is just for pedagogical convenience that I divided into five stages. We could divide it into 55 uh, or 75, but uh, with five stages, you get plenty of ideas that they can move relative to one another, okay, and as they will with changes in the interest rate, okay? We can track the resources through the stages of production and it's simp in its simplest mode, this is sort of a goods in process uh, picture of the economy, goods moving through the structure of production eventually merging as finished goods. Uh, let's see if we can do that, watch the resources or goods in process move through. There they are. Now, this is an old triangle. This, this is one that was wrenched into existence uh, in 1931. So this is not some newfangled idea. It's been around since 1931 when Hayek uh, introduced it in his uh, LSE lectures. So he introduced it when Henry Ford was still producing the Model A. It's a long time ago. So let's try to produce a couple of Model A's here and see if we can do that. There they go. Okay. <laughs> It works, okay? Uh, not to suggest that the triangle is an assembly line. I mean, Henry Ford owned uh, iron ore fields. You know, he, he started with uh, bringing iron ore to the surface. So it was an early stage uh, of production 
indeed. Okay. Now, look at that consumption there. That consumption is the same consumption uh, that we saw before. with the PPF. In other words, for a given year, the consumption output is that very consumption that's measured uh, on the PPF. Looks like that. Okay. Uh, and again, we can uh, imagine the economy in a very healthy way. Uh, it shifts outward and the triangle grows too. Okay. You get more in each stage and uh, more output uh, as a result. This is just the economy making good on replacement capital plus some. Right. Ongoing growth, secular growth, sometimes it's called. All right, but more importantly, uh, the triangle can change in shape. Okay, it's unique to the Austrian school. The uh, Keynesians assume, quote, a fixed structure of industry. They just disallow, as a matter of assumption, a fixed structure of industry. So when people choose to say more, they send two, I say, seemingly conflicting signals. One is uh, decreased consumption dampens the demand for the investment goods that are in close proximity with consumable output. This is the only thing that Keynes saw. If you, if you don't consume, if you don't go out and buy, that'll dampen investment. We'll go into depression, so keep buying. And if you don't keep buying, well, we'll have a cash for clunkers program or something and, and uh, inspire you to buy, so it won't give you that effect. But that's just one effect. Uh, the reduced interest rate, that means lower borrowing costs, which stimulates demand in the early stages. And the earlier the stage, the more it stimulates demand. Uh, because borrowing costs are a big part of the cost of production if it's a long time before you're going to get any uh, revenues from what you're doing. All right? Uh, so it's disproportionately important uh, in the early stages. Plus, plus what's relevant for a production decision that's going to take a long time to mature, what's relevant is not how much people are consuming now, it's how much they're going to be able and willing to consume when you've got the stuff ready to sell. And that might well be a pretty strong demand because people are saving now. They're saving up for something. People don't save for fun. It's not fun. They save up for something. And it's the entrepreneur's job to figure out what they're most likely to buy in the future. And he, can, and he can get it going now at a low rate of interest, okay? So, so there's increased uh, investment in the early stages. And here I point out that the, these are seemingly in conflict uh, only in a Keynesian model where you uh, represent all of investment with a single variable called I, investment. So Keynes would say, well look, here's I, total investment, no matter what the stage, we have a fixed structure of industry, and derived demand is pushing it down, and the interest rate supposedly is pushing it up. Well, hey folks, we think it goes down. You know, just a net effect, it goes down. But if you've got multi-stages, you can let both effects take place. It changes the shape of the triangle, and changes the temporal pattern of output to match the desired saving. If you want to save now to consume more later, you need uh, a, a production process that will deliver the goods later. Okay? So really, both of these effects are at work together. It says, watch the structure of production respond to an increase in saving. What do you think is going to happen? Well, labor and other resources are going to move out of late stages where demand is down and earn and, and into uh, early stages where borrowing costs are low. Okay, watch. There it goes. Okay, so you get a structure of production uh, that is longer, it's more roundabout, as Bon uh, and uh, at least in the current period, it's not it's not producing as much consumption good, but the economy will grow faster, and it, and it eventually will. Uh, once again, I show it with the PPF. So watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. We're going to get more investment, which you'll see on the right side, and it's going to be in a different pattern, which you'll see on the left side. Here it goes. Okay, so you move along the frontier with the increase in saving, 
and disproportionately you get uh, a lot of investment in the early stages because borrowing costs are cheap okay after which the economy grows more rapidly and here you see more investment over there and over here you see a, a change in the pattern okay less investment in the late stage more investment in the early stage Watch the economy grow, and now uh, you can see, you have to look at both triangles. You see the triangle was uh, producing uh, with that greater slope of the, the triangle, and then uh, it uh, tilted down when you save more. So what I like to do now is simply plot consumption against time. And you can see in either diagram that consumption first falls and then ra and rises at a, at a greater rate. Look at it first over in the uh, PPF diagram. Okay. And look at it in the uh, Hayekin triangle. Consumption first fell and then grew at a, a higher rate. Now, the way that plots out down here is that the economy was growing already, but then when people saved, uh, consumption fell but then it grew at a higher rate all right uh, more rapidly than it would have grown had it not been for the saving and what that emphasizes is that this decision to save more uh, is actually an intertemporal trade-off that people are giving up a certain amount of savings in the near future in order to be able to enjoy more consumption in the later future. That's what, that's what saving is all about. Now I'm sounding like your parents again, okay? But uh, the point is that there's a link between saving and sustainable growth. There it is. Okay, I'm going to step up the pace a little bit here so I can show you what happens when uh, the central bank gets involved. But uh, now I'm simply replacing these photographs uh, of uh, product development and, uh, and stocking at retail with supply and demand diagrams. Uh, and you can see what would happen here, that is, if, if demand is down at Target, then the demand for workers at Target shifts to the left, okay, reduce demand for workers there. But if credit is cheap in the early stages, then there'll be an increased demand to hire labor and uh, undertake investments in the early stages. So let's see if we got something to watch here. That's what that's. Okay, let me do that again so we can see. It says, watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. And you know what happens to the triangle, same thing as before. But here you see labor shifting to the left here and shifting to the right here. More demand for labor in the early stages, less demand in the late stages. Hayek in his 1931 book uh, even called this uh, change in the pattern of wages as described by a wage rate gradient. See, while the economy is adjusting to this new structure, wages will be generally higher in the early stages as opposed to the late stages. That's the market mechanism. That's how the market works to get labor out of the late stages and into the early stages. Okay, now I have a summary graph. We give it names here. There's the loanable funds market, linked to the PPF, linked to the Hayek and Triangle, and the stage-specific labor markets. And so we're in a position here to say, watch the economy respond to an increase in saving. Well, you know what's going to happen. Everything works together. And if people save more, uh, you get, let's watch, saving shift out, movement along the frontier, the shuffling of the stages of production aided by uh, differential changes in the labor market. Okay, so that's sustainable growth. That's sustainable growth. That's see, and that's what Hayek meant is that you first have to understand how things can go right before you can see uh, what goes wrong. All right, I include this uh, slide just because this guy, this is Steve Hankey. He looks so stern. I think you're inclined to believe him. Maybe more than you believe me. I'm not sure. But he wrote this in Forbes. That's mainstream stuff. Isn't it? So look what he wrote. It says, if interest rates are artificially low, consumers reduce saving in favor of consumption. 
and entrepreneurs increase the rate of investment spending and then you have an imbalance between saving and investment you have an economy on an unsustainable growth path this is in a nutshell is a lesson of the Austrian critique of central banking developed in the 1920s and 30s. So here he's just summarizing what happens when things go wrong, when, when that rate of interest is falsified by the central bank. Uh, I have one slide I'm going to almost skip over because it's Hayek sort of reaffirming his life. And uh, he said, he made this statement about the same time that picture was taken. So. Uh, essentially, he's, he's confirming that he still believes the theory. A lot of critics of the Austrian school say, well, Hayek never believed the theory in, the, in his late years. Well, he did. I won't take the time to read it, but that's what that says. Okay. Now, you see, I'm almost out of time, but in a way that's significant uh, because most of the work in understanding the business cycle is understanding how the economy would work if the central bank wasn't interfering. If you look at the central bank interference, it's almost a corollary. If, if the interest rate isn't working right, then the growth is unsustainable, okay? It's just a corollary to the whole understanding of how it works. So uh, here it says, new money masquerades as saving. That is, the supply of loanable funds shifts to the right, but without there being an increase in saving. So this S stands for both supply of loanable funds and saving but you sort of you, you sort of separate those two by simply pumping money and padding and padding saving with money created for the purpose all right you trick the economy spoof the economy into thinking that uh, there's that there's more saving this is a fundamentally different process it's not really the market at work for you and for me uh, instead uh, it's Alan Greenspan <laughs> <laughs> with his hand on the supply of credit, okay? And that's going to cause something different from what you've already seen. So he shifts that supply. There it is. It disappears from sight. Uh, and let's, let's happen what will. Well, you can guess what will happen. Instead of getting a new equilibrium, uh, you get a, a, a double disequilibrium, essentially. Uh, and it's not sustainable at all because people are actually saving less. This is the old saving curve, and, and that hasn't changed. This is just funny money added to it, okay? So people save less because they're getting less further trouble, okay? They can't get much interest. Why say? Let's go ahead and spend now, all right? While investors are borrowing more because credit's cheap. Uh, and you can see there's a little triangle there. We call it a wedge, drive a wedge between saving and investment. So investors are moving down that demand curve because interest uh, is uh, more favorable. Savers are moving down the supply curve, not interested in saving if that's all they get for their trouble. And the discrepancy is essentially uh, patched over with the new money. That, that horizontal distance is the new money that allows this much borrowing in spite of the fact there's only that much saving. Okay, so they're borrowing partly what people saved, which is even less than before, and partly what Greenspan created. Okay. Now, not a healthy situation. Uh, if we trace upstairs here, uh, we have to trace up in two ways. If you, if you look at investors, uh, they're trying to pull the economy along the PPF in the direction of more investment. Uh, if you look at consumers, they're trying to pull in the direction of more consumption. Okay, so you have sort of a double, you have a tug of war going on here. And in fact, if you pay attention to the axes, uh, this wedge between saving and investment uh, amounts to an upward pull, that's more consumption, and a horizontal rightward pull, that's more investment. The resolution of that vector is somewhere out there beyond the PPF in what I call a, a virtual equilibrium. You can't get there. You're outside the PPF. You can't get there. But the economy can try and it gets overheated. Uh, you get unemployment rate way below its natural level. Bill Clinton had it down to 3.9%. Uh, so you get more workers and they can produce more output than what the PPF uh, allows, but only temporarily. 
Okay? And so what happens here, let's, let's bring in the uh, stages of production. What's going on here is, the, again, you get two signals. Uh, you get the cheap credit signal with people undertaking uh, building of a lot of houses and undertaking extraction uh, industry activities and product development back here and dot com and all that. You get that, but it can't be finished because the resources aren't available to finish it. They haven't been saved. In fact, more is being consumed. Okay, uh, if you look at the consumption side of it, there's a demand for consumption now because people don't want to save even as much as before because they're not getting as much for their savings. So they're trying to consume. Resources are being pulled in both directions at the same time. Uh, and that links up uh, completely with uh, terminology used by Mises, the dynamics of boom and bust entails, well, overinvestment, that's what shows up in the PPF, but more uniquely to the Austrian school, malinvestment, which means it's predominantly in the early stages, and that's not going to work out, folks, because the savings won't support it. Uh, the, dis the distortions are compounded by overconsumption, which you can see on the PPF and even on the Hayekian uh, triangle. Uh, it's a phrase used often by Mises. He repeatedly uses the phrase malinvestment and overconsumption as characterizing the boom. Okay? So you, you've got consumers and investors working at cross purposes because the interest rate is not telling the truth. It's been distorted. Tug of war that pits the consumers against investors pushes the economy beyond the PPF. Okay, the low rate of interest favors investment and increasingly binding resource constraints because they haven't been freed up, people are consuming more, keeps the economy from reaching the extra PPF point. So watch up there on the, on the uh, PPF and watch uh, the economy move beyond the PPF, predominantly towards investment. Uh, the crunch comes. Uh, and it falls back to the PPF and even caves into depression. Okay, so it looks like that. Now, that's the sequence. Hayek called this secondary depression. In other words, you know, the, the economy doesn't hit that PPF, stop, take a right, and move back to where it was before. There's no mechanism to do that. Uh, it's likely to cave into uh, the middle of the, of the PPF. You're in depression. What's significant is Keynes only saw that movement in the frontier. That, that, that's all that was on his radar screen. He didn't see what was going on uh, uh, before that. He thought 1920s were a fine period. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, see, we have the language of disequilibrium. We've got the wedge between saving and investment, the tug of war between consumers and investors, dueling triangles as uh, named by John Cochran of uh, Metropolitan State in Colorado. I like that uh, term. Uh, and uh, so that's what it looks like. Now, this sounds like a management course. I'm going to use the three P's, but it helps you remember. Padding the supply of loanable funds with new money drives a wedge between saving and investment. Papering over the distance, difference, literally and figuratively, between saving and investment gives play to the tug of war between consumers and investors. And pitting early stage against late stage distorts the high and triangle in both directions, the temporal discoordination eventually turning boom into bust. Okay? So watch the economy respond to a credit expansion. And Greenspan now wonder what happened going, and, and now he's blaming the market. He says, well, the market wasn't as good as I thought. No, no, well, that's not the problem, you know. <laughs> Bernanke is not too happy with it all. You recognize him? Joe the plumber. You know, can't you guys get anything straight, you know? He's just a working man. Okay.
Now, just a, just a contrast, a sharp contrast between the two procedures. Saving supports genuine growth, okay? Watch. That's the market at work for you and for me. Leave it alone and the growth you get will be genuine growth, okay? And increased credit expansion gets you boom and buzzed. Watch. It doesn't look pretty. It doesn't look pretty at all. That's the book I wrote in uh, 2001 from which I took this. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, time for questions. Yes. So, so how fast is the shape of that triangle? Because what if you, uh, what if the investment is stimulated artificially, but the growth is enough to cover consumption? Uh, at what point is it really unsustainable? Okay, the, the, the question as I understand it is, maybe I kind of rephrase it. How do you know the bust will come before the, the, the early stages actually mature into late stages and become consumption? Is that what you're think, saying? How do we know it will be artificial just because it was stimulated by the central bank? Yeah, well, I mean, like, if, if they stimulate just, say, a little bit, by like 2% rate right? uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't heard that question before, but what if, what if the central bank just stimulates a little bit, okay, just stimulates a little bit? Well, uh, I think what will happen uh, is, is that that will give rise to, uh, still, it's, uh, it's a conflict within the structure of production, and when that conflict starts to show up in the middling stages, halfway through the process, then the Fed would be inspired to stimulate a little more. Okay, to try to try to patch up the weakness that the, that they've created, and so uh, it's it's hard to stimulate just a little bit, uh, and then leave it alone. And of course, I mean, it's, it's obvious if they stimulate a little bit and did nothing else, that would be less disruptive than if they stimulated a lot. But it would still be uh, still be disruptive. It would it would distort the inner temporal market mechanisms. Uh, one point. Let me just make one more point, and I'll go on. Uh, there's a controversy, it seems, uh, as to whether the boom and bust, all told, is net a good thing or net a bad thing. Now, of course, the Austrians uh, argue it's a bad thing because w when you get the crash, you, you, you get uh, a destruction of, of some partially completed production process. Uh, and so you, you, you essentially waste resources in just getting back to where you were, uh, and so you never recover completely. There's a, only a partial recovery. The other argument is that, oh well, when you stimulate though, you give rise to some new technologies, like dot-com stuff and so on, and the new technologies are so great that that sort of, that sort of swamps uh, whatever other dislocation there might be. I think that's a fanciful argument. I mean. Uh, uh, new technologies should come about in the market process undistorted rather than trying to distort in favor of uh, new technologies. Bernanke is certainly on the side of the technology explanation. He, he, he has argued specifically that uh, there, there may well have been a net gain just because of the technological discovery that the boom stimulated. Think of it, okay? And he even put it uh, poetically. He said, "'Tis better to have boomed and busted than never to have boomed at all." <laughs> I think that's wrong, okay, that's wrong. A boom and bust is always a, a net loss, all right? Was there a question back here somewhere? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, there, yeah. If, you know, if uh, if China is willing to save and, and let us use the savings and command the resources, uh, that is not unsustainable. That's not unsustainable. Uh, you know, we 
it, it allows, they're the ones consuming less, freeing up uh, resources, uh, padding our savings, uh, and that can give rise to a genuine boom. Another part of the answer I could give you is that uh, certainly technological change can give rise to a boom. This is a genuine boom. Okay, if if uh, improvements in technology actually make it possible to transform a given amount of resources into more output than before, hey, that's that's real stuff. That's not there's nothing artificial about it. And it turns out that uh, most boom-bust episodes uh, ride piggyback on genuine technological booms. Uh, and, and it's easy to see why, if you know the history of the central bank and how it's set up. Uh, written into the legislation of the central bank is something called the Real Bills Doctrine which essentially says that the Fed should accommodate demand for credit. Okay? It doesn't say at what interest rate. And so the Fed takes that to mean at whatever interest rate uh, prevailed when the demand increases. Okay? So you have an interest rate, the demand for credit increases, and the Fed steps in and provides that credit this is a point made during the uh, panel discussion we had uh, just yesterday. Uh, and so if you look at the important booms and busts in the 20th century, you get the 1920s, which was a period of great innovations in automobile production, in the production of uh, appliances to take advantage of electrification, uh, of processed food, of chemicals, uh, and uh, all sorts of things. There's lots of innovations which made it possible to produce more. And it produced more by borrowing at unchanged rates because the Fed was pumping money in to provide uh, the credit to take advantage of those innovations. Well, you had two things going on at once. You had a genuine boom based on the increase in technology plus on top of that an artificial boom based on the Fed pumping in credit, holding the interest rates down below where they would have been. Uh, and so that gave you the 1920s, the roaring, booming 20s, and then the caving into depression. In more recent episodes, the digital revolution was genuine. There really was a digital revolution. And it gave rise to demands for credit to, to exploit the possibilities provided by uh, all of the all of the innovations there. Well, guess what? The Fed provided more credit. Okay, so there's two things. You got the innovation, which would give you a genuine boom, plus the providing of more credit by pumping money into the system that put an artificial boom on top of it. And so you got the dot com boom and bust. Now, if there's a dis if there's a difference of the recent boom and bust relative to the others, it's it's neither aspect of it was genuine. You, you got the housing run up, not because of increased technology or any innovation, but because the government was subsidizing home ownership. So that in itself was artificial. And then it was magnified by the fact that Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Barney Frank, or whatever, uh, managed to supply more credit uh, in order to keep interest rates from rising. So you got a double whammy artificial boom, which has given us a double whammy bust, okay, which may endure for some time now, just on the grounds that, that both aspects of it were artificial from the get go, right? So, yeah? Uh, it's quite clear from your presentation that it's the boom which is unnatural and the bust which is necessary to get rid of all the Do you have any predictions on what would happen, uh, on what happens uh, when? The malinvestment is not allowed to be adjusted. That we have bankruptcy laws which mm -hmm. are uh, now so prone towards keeping firms intact rather than letting them liquidate. That yeah. after yeah. your bust, you really don't have a bust. Yeah. So, so yeah. So the question happens. is, what what happens when the the market is not allowed to liquidate the maladjustments? And the short answer is uh, is that the depression lasts longer, uh, and the the 
the clearest example of that is in Japan with, with what's called crony capitalism, uh, which, which gave Japan a, a, a lost decade uh, in trying to recover from their similar problems because they wouldn't let companies that were bankrupt or especially financial institutions that were bankrupt go bankrupt. And of course, Obama is just taking a page out of the playbook of Japan. And we're getting that same thing. We're getting bailouts and we're getting uh, all sorts of uh, policies that, that keep uh, that keep the uh, liquidation of, of, of bad assets. Uh, it's advertised uh, differently by Obama. He calls it saved jobs. <laughs> our, our packages are saving jobs. Well, they're saving jobs that ought to be lost. In other words, those are the jobs and those are the areas that need to contract and free up resources to, to uh, restructure the economy in a way that's uh, consistent with people's actual preferences. Yeah, so you get a longer, longer bus. Yeah. I'd like to ask you, how much does the exposition of Western business cycle theory depend on the assumption that the supply of savings because the supply of savings in Europe is positively inclined? Uh, okay, so the, the question is how much of the theory depends on uh, the uh, saving curve being relatively interest elastic, let's say, how, actually having an upward slope as opposed to being straight up and down. Uh, well, it doesn't, it actually, analytically, it doesn't depend wholly on that because as, as long as the demand for investment funds is negatively sloped, uh, you still get that wedge and you still get um, a discrepancy between the amount borrowed and the amount uh, saved. But uh, uh, I think that uh, the saving curve is sloping upwards. I mean, people in this recent episode, People have been inclined not to save much at all out of current income. I mean, savings has been down to zero out of current income in recent years, and precisely because there's not much incentive to save. Interest rates are so low, okay? And if interest rates, real interest rates were higher, then they would be inclined to save. So I, I don't think that's much in dispute. We can argue about just how how elastic is it? But as long as uh, supply slopes upward and demand slopes downward, the uh, internal logic of the theory is, uh, is sound. Let me take maybe one more question over here. Or, right, yeah, you back there. You back. Why are we empirically testing? Well, uh, this is a point that, that uh, Betke made, that the, that, the, that the big movements for which data is collected, and that whole data collection system is based on the Keynesian theory, is the movements during the bust, okay? And, uh, the, uh, uh, and consu when co consumption and investment do move together, because you're sinking into the PPF, uh, to test on uh, the boom, what you'd have to look, out, look at is movements in interest rates relative to what they would have been had the market been allowed to determine interest rates. Uh, if you get the time series on interest rates during the 20s, you see that it didn't change much. So with all econometric testing, you can't, you can't have an independent variable that doesn't change much. It's not going to tell you anything econometrically. Okay? In some of the co correspondence I've had from Friedman, for instance, where uh, he was disputing the Austrian theory, he actually sent me uh, a time series plot of interest rates during the 20s. And uh, he says, look, the interest rate didn't change much during the 20s. So how can that be a causal factor? Well, of course, the reason it's a causal factor uh, is because, because of the reason it didn't change much. Namely, the, the Federal Reserve was pumping enough money in to keep it from rising when otherwise it would have risen. Uh, but there's no there's no data on how much it would have risen. All right, so much more difficult to, to test empirically for that kind of a reason. I think we're out of time. I want to end on time. So thank you very much.
you, Roger. If I could have your attention for just a couple minutes here, we're going to begin.